Greetings in the love of Christ. Waiting. No one likes to wait. And yet life is full of waiting. Most especially now, in this strange time of pandemic. We've been waiting continuously since mid-March. When will the cure finally be available? When is this going to end? Psalm 130 is a psalm about waiting. It is one of the psalm of trust, and yet it almost begins as a psalm of trouble. The psalmist is crying out to the Lord from a place of deep pain and distress. But the focus is not on waiting through the pain. It is about waiting in hope, which is, make, which is what makes it one of the psalms of trust. This psalm is simple, yet it has profound message for us today that those who wait on the Lord wait in hope that believers in Christ do not wait in desperation or despair this psalm tells us three things about waiting on the Lord one cry to the Lord for mercy second wait for the Lord expectantly and three put your hope in the Lord this is also a psalm of ascent one ascending from the depths of despair to a joyful confidence in the God of the gospel. The Psalms of Ascent were likely sung by pilgrims journeying up to worship in Jerusalem at annual festivals. As God's people traverse the dirt roads and winding paths to the city, these Psalms would be sung and act as prayers to tune their hearts for hope-filled worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. This psalm opens with a desperate cry for the Lord to have mercy. The psalmist is aware that his sin has created a deep chasm between him and God and longs for the Lord to turn his ear toward him and show mercy. Instead of remaining in despair by dwelling on personal failures, the psalmist looks upward in the next verses. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. Indeed, no one could stand before God if he marked our iniquities. God designed it that way. But in him there is forgiveness by the shed blood of Christ on our behalf. The chasm between us and God caused by sin can be closed. Why do you think God offers us forgiveness? Now you might think so he would be loved or shown merciful and surely those are true. But the psalmist takes another route here. He said that you may be feared. If our problem is offending a holy God because of our sin, then sin must not only be forgiven, but we must repent and do whatever we can to stop sinning. Our hearts must change to no longer desire sin. It is not enough to cling to God's grace and live in sin so grace abounds. Knowing forgiveness in Christ at a heart level leads us to fear God and hate sin. For the fear of the Lord is hatred toward sin. Hating sin and beholding God's kindness shown in sending Christ to the cross in our place causes us to fear God and turn from sin. God's kindness indeed is meant to lead us to repentance. This psalm documents the believer preaching the gospel to himself, reminding himself of God's abundant and undeserved mercy in Christ toward repentant sinners, which leads not only to a, fear, to a fear of God, but also a joyful hope in Him. And that is how the psalmist's prayer continues. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. In the original Hebrew, the words wait and hope overlap meaning and are oftentimes synonymous. The last four verses of the psalm mention hoping or waiting five times, proving it to be a major theme of the psalm's second half here. Hoping in the Lord rests on who He is and what He has done, and in this case, on forgiving. Hope 
flows from the fount of knowing and feeling the one who is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Instead of rightly condemning us, God condemned Christ in our place so that we could be left spotless and clean in His sight. We hope in God because in Christ He is for us. He has brought us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the marvelous kingdom of His beloved Son. He is on our side. Hope in God calls us to forsake all other hopes. Hope in our own performance. Hope in our abilities. Hope in our relationships. Loving family, members, friends. Hope also in future prospects for a good life. Or even hope in what we do for God. We wait for the Lord and hope in His Word alone. Because His Word confirms His character to us. The promises of His Word reveal that we can and we must hope in Him. And this hope will start to dawn for us as a watchman awaits the sunrise. Seeing a glimmer of light at the break of dawn and increasing more and more each moment He waits. Our hope will be more than that of the watchman. For our hope rest not in everyday occurrences like the sun rising. No, our hope rests in the grace poured out to those who are in Christ. Hope of acceptance by a holy God, a new life here on earth, an eternal life enjoying God's presence in heaven forever. Hope will start to dawn in your life as the gospel takes root in your heart. One thing this sound proves is that hope will start indeed to dawn in your life as the gospel takes root in your heart. And so, hope is great indeed. This hope in Christ is great. It cannot stay contained. It must flow outward as the psalmist says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with Him is plentiful redemption, and He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. The psalmist renewed hope in gospel promises flows into public exhortations for God's people to hope in Him. I can hear the psalmist singing, shouting joyfully from the depths of his heart, With the Lord there is steadfast love. With Him is plentiful redemption. Brothers and sisters, do you share the psalmist's hope? Does hope in the God of the gospel turn your waiting or your discouragement, your groans of anguish, Turn all of those to shouts of joy, to singing of praises unto the Lord? Do you rejoice that God will indeed redeem you and all His people from our iniquities? Now let these truths pour out from your mouths in joyful song of praise to the One who redeems us from our iniquities by becoming iniquity for us so that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Let's worship our Lord now. I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy, Lord Were you to count my sin How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. 
to do what is right. Praise will lead me to heaven when I see your face. And never cease to thank you for your grace. Grace abounding strong and true that makes me long to be like you. That turns me from my selfish pride To love the cross on which you died Grace unending all my days You'll give me strength to run this race when my years on earth are through, the praise will all belong to you. Praise God, for my sins and brought me to life. These are the words of the Lord. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from Him. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer me, O Lord my God. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. 
O Heavenly Father, help us to persevere as we wait on you in the study of your holy word and prayer because your word, O Lord, is a firm ground for a waiting soul to rest upon. Teach us, O God, teach us every day how to walk worthy of our calling in Jesus Christ, trusting continually and obeying our Lord moment by moment, walking by faith in His holy path. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are again, doing church online. What a bummer. I say this not only because the MECQ dampens our joy of worshiping together face to face, but it also signifies that the rate of infection in our country, especially here in Metro Manila, is not slowing down. And of course, part of the collateral damage is the painful blow this does to our already wobbling economy. As God's people, we need to go down on our knees some more and pray for our people, the IATF, and the national government. But in the face of this, we should not lose heart. Let us continually trust and hope in God, for there will be a light at the end of this dark tunnel. Let's just hope that it would be sooner rather than later. Join me now in a word of prayer. Dear God and Father, though we are back doing church online, still we are grateful, still we praise you, because of this technology, we are able to still worship in our respective homes. We trust, dear God, that your name will be exalted, and we trust that your Holy Spirit will instruct us, open our minds and our hearts, give us understanding, allow us, dear Lord, to be sanctified by your word. Thank you once again for our time together. In Jesus' name. In one Peanuts cartoon, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole wide world. Charlie Brown then says, But I thought you had inner peace. Lucy replies, I do have inner peace, but I have outer obnoxiousness. If the quarantine has not made you lose your sense of humor, you would probably find that anecdote amusing. But if we are believers, we cannot be like Lucy, to be consumed by hate. Unfortunately, there is a bit of Lucy in many of us. There are days when our outer obnoxiousness gets the better of us and we end up saying the H word. I mean, we could be going about our day and some unpleasant things pile up on us one after the other. So we become upset, tense, frustrated, and before long, we are boiling mad, calling people names, and breathing hatred. It's very much like the story of the mother and her little boy who were driving down the street. She took extra care driving as she had her young boy with her. Noticing his mother's calmness behind the wheel, the boy's curiosity was aroused. He asked, Mommy, why do the idiots only come out when daddy drives? Does that happen to you? When you're driving, are you all the idiots suddenly out on the street? Of course, I don't mean that literally. They don't come out only when you're driving. The problem is not them, but you. Many things around us can set us off. And at that point, we're like Lucy, mouthing, I hate everything, I hate everybody, I hate the whole wide world. By human standards, there are some people who are just not worthy of our love. They don't deserve it, and so we don't give it. Often, it's either a love or hate relationship. I love him, I love him not, 
That's the way it works. But the Lord Jesus has a different approach. He therefore taught in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We opened a study of this passage last week, and we noted that our Lord is presenting here the last of the corrective illustrations to address the scribes and the Pharisees' distorted teachings of the Mosaic Law. In our text today, our Lord is calling attention to the erroneous teaching, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. This teaching was actually half a quotation of the law and half a fabrication. The teaching, love your neighbor, was drawn from the law of Moses, most specifically Leviticus 19 verse 18 which reads, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. As we can see in this verse, the religious leaders during our Lord's Day conveniently obscured the portion, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we explained last week that this may have been because of two reasons. First, we said that they view the command to mean that they were to love only their neighbor and not to bother with the rest. Thus, when our Lord broke into the scene, the Jews hated the Samaritans, the Gentiles, and anybody outside their realm. You might therefore say that they were dyed to the wool racists. And this was what the Jewish religious leaders taught. For this reason, the Jews were stunned when our Lord taught the parable of the Good Samaritan. But as we pointed out last week, the Jews did not have warrant to think this way because Leviticus 19 verses 22 to 34 instructed them not to do wrong to the stranger who resides in their land and to love him as yourself. The rabbinic tradition had omitted the phrase, as yourself because it could not fit into their scheme of proud self-righteousness. Second, we noted last week that the rabbinic tradition assumed that it was all right to omit love, others, or enemies as yourself, because they had misinterpreted passages from the Old Testament as approving the hatred of one's enemies. They probably dwelt on passages like, Deuteronomy 7, verse 2, chapter 20, verses 16 to 18, where the Lord God commanded the nation to destroy the Canaanites totally, men, women, and children, without treaty and mercy. The Pharisees, however, erred in realizing that God's commands in these controversial passages were given during the time when the Israelites were instructed to conquer the Canaanites in order to occupy the land that God had promised them. God was still establishing His chosen nation, and He did not want His people to be infected with the depravity and corruption of the Canaanites, which was the most vile and wicked known in history. But when these tribes occupying the Promised Land had been driven away, and these people were living peaceably among the Jews, they were told not to do them wrong, but to love them as themselves. The Jews also read the imprecatory prayers in a number of passages in the book of Psalms and thus found justification for hating their enemies. But again, they missed the fact that these Psalms were written not for the cause of personal vendetta, but out of concern for God's holiness 
and justice to be executed on those who despise the Lord's glorious name and persecuted his people. So the Lord's teaching here was revolutionary in terms of the moral challenge it presented to the disciples. And our Lord is affirming here the truth that the people are to love their neighbor, but the law is intended to restrain hatred, not to justify it against those you do not consider to be your neighbors. The law is only a starting place. It is merely a shadow cast on man's sinful life by God's original desire that we should love all men and that in this fallen world we should love our enemies. So because our Lord saw how the Jews perverted God's commands, he said, love your enemies. To most Jews who were listening to him, they would have thought that the Lord was directing them first towards loving the Romans who occupied their lands. Would the Romans love the Jews back? No. The Lord does not promise here that love will turn enemies into friends. Our love of enemies is independent of the person loved, independent of their rank or attractiveness. Now, if we are to live this out, we must obviously first of all be clear as to what the Lord Jesus is asking. What does our Lord mean by loving our enemies? Well, I think understanding the Greek word used here would be helpful. But we need to understand that Greek is a language which is rich in synonyms. Greek words often have shades of meaning which other languages, including English, do not possess. In the Greek, there are four different words for love. There is the, word, the noun storge, with its accompanying verb storgin. These words are the characteristic words of family love. They are words which describe the love of a parent for a child and a child for a parent. Another Greek word for love is the noun eros and the accompanying verb eran. These words describe the love of man for a woman. This love describes the passion between them. There is sexual love. In these words, there is nothing essentially bad. They simply describe the passion of human love. But as time went on, these words began to be tinged with the idea of lust rather than love. But this idea of lust for the word eros was never used in the New Testament at all. Then there is philia with its accompanying verb philine. These words describe real love, real affection. Its present participle is the word which describes a man's closest and nearest and truest friends. There is also the word agape, with its accompanying verb agapan. These words indicate unconquerable benevolence, invisible goodwill. In our text, agape is the word that our Lord used. If we regard a person with agape, it means that no matter what that person does to us, no matter how he treats us, no matter if he insults us or injures us or grieves us, we will never allow any bitterness against him to invade our hearts, but will regard him with benevolence and goodwill and will seek nothing but his highest good. But we need to qualify a few things about this. We need to underscore that the Lord Jesus never asked us to love our enemies in the same way that we love our nearest and our dearest. To love our enemies in the same way as we love our nearest and our dearest would neither be possible nor right. In the case of our nearest and dearest, we cannot help loving them. 
our love for them is something that comes to us even if it is unsought. It is something which is born of the emotions of the heart. But in the case of our enemies, if we are to love them, it is not only something of the heart, it is also something of the will. It is something that is not natural for us. It is something which we will have to will ourselves into doing. So agape means a determination of the mind whereby we extend goodwill even to those who hurt or injure us. This is not to say that agape does not involve the emotion. It may certainly involve this, but it must translate to action. We are not to love merely in terms of feeling, but in terms of action as well. But agape also implies that Christian love does not mean that we allow people to do absolutely as they like and that we leave them unchecked or unrestrained. I mean, no one would say that a parent really loves his child if he lets the child do as he likes. If we regard people in goodwill, it will often mean that we must reprove him, that we must restrain him, that we must discipline him, that we must even punish him, that we must protect him against himself. But this also means that we do not punish him to satisfy our thirst for revenge, but in order to make him a better person. And this will also mean that all Christian discipline and all Christian punishment must be aimed not at vengeance but at cure. In other words, punishment will never be retributive. It will always be remedial or as a cure. Our enemies may not necessarily be those who threaten to kill us. An enemy can just be somebody on the opposing side of an issue. They may just be people who are unfriendly in the sense that they are hostile to the values and beliefs that are important to us. There are lots of areas where we can find enemies. And if we can't find them, we can always make them. It's easy. All we need are some strong differences. I mean, take social media, for instance. How many people have made enemies because they stand on a different side of an issue? The meaning of enemy that most quickly comes to mind are enemy nations, those who oppose our values, or those who infringe on our national interests. But we can also have enemies in our own country. There are political enemies and religious enemies. Those who do not value what we value or believe what we believe. Sometimes people identify enemies by their nationality. Maybe you have an enemy in your business, an unrighteous competitor. Perhaps you have a rival for one's affections. The word may perhaps be too strong, but we have all discovered personal enemies, people who have wronged us or hurt us. And the natural thing to do is to hate them back. Hate them for what they do or what they believe or what they value or where they come from or what they threaten to take away from us. But the Lord Jesus was crystal clear. Whoever he is, the correct way to respond to your enemy is not to hate, but to love him. That is not natural. It is a response that is foreign to us, that the only way we are going to obey the Lord's instruction is by asking God to change us. Is it not interesting that the Lord tells us to pray for those who persecute us? Why did he instruct us to do this? You see, it is prayer that often changes our hearts and moves us from the natural response 
to the supernatural response. The truth is we cannot genuinely pray for someone without hoping for their good. But when we genuinely pray for an enemy, often animosity dwindles and compassion increases. To be sure, we don't have what it takes to love enemies, but God does. God's love is the source and model for love of enemies. St. Augustine said that God's love is incomprehensible and unchangeable in that He began to love us before we were reconciled to Him through the blood of His Son. The wonderful thing is that the Lord Jesus is not telling us to do something that He did not do Himself. Consider how He loved His enemies. Romans chapter 5 reminds us that He came to the earth while we were still sinners and died for us so that we could be saved from our sins. Moreover, while hanging on the cross, our Redeemer prayed for His enemies and persecutors. In Luke 23 verse 34, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, our Lord knew that Christians would not only see this as a daunting duty, but would also feel that this is impossible to do. For this reason, He gives two motivations to help us strive for this goal. The first motivation for loving our enemies is God's character. We read in verse 45, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Of course, the Lord does not mean here that acts of love are the instruments we should use to gain the status of being sons or daughters of God. Rather, we demonstrate that we are God's children when we love as our Heavenly Father loves. And even so, the goal is not chiefly to demonstrate or prove something to God. The truth is we cannot demonstrate anything worthwhile or prove anything that will merit divine approval. What the Lord wants us to do is to aspire to divine love. God's very nature and practice is to love people, even His enemies. As we noted earlier, we see this in the Lord Jesus, who loved his enemies and prayed for his persecutors. This is his character and nature. Thus, to love our enemies is to pursue a life pattern after God. Generally speaking, children resemble their parents. Thus, when we choose to love our enemies, we resemble our Father in heaven and show that we are God's children. And we must not forget that it is our destiny and obligation to be conformed to the character of God. We read this in Romans chapter 8 verse 29, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 49, and 1 John chapter 3 verses 2 and 3. For this reason, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 verse 32 up to chapter 5 verse 2, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. God is our pattern when we love our enemies and pray for our foes. But it is even more than this, as you will notice in verse 45. The Lord does not merely say that you will be sons of your father. There is a further explanation given. He said in verse 45, the second part, For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, by observing God's handiwork in creation, we learn that He is in full control. And the more closely we study His creation, 
the more His goodness becomes apparent. Thus, we can sing with the psalmist in Psalm 145 verses 8 to 9, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. Notice that the psalmist saw God's goodness and mercies to all, or over all his works, that is, to the righteous and the unrighteous. Verses 15 and 16 of Psalm 145 add, The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So whether it is the birds of the air, the beasts of the forest, or the fish in the sea, abundant provision has been made to supply their every need. Man also has abundant reasons to say with the psalmist in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. You see, everything about the structure of our bodies attests to the goodness of our Maker. I mean, just take a look at your hands. How suited they are to perform their assigned function. How good of the Lord to appoint sleep to refresh our weary bodies. We also read that God gives food to all flesh. Psalm 136 verse 25. In Psalm 33 verse 5, he says, The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The Lord God gives those blessings without respect to merit or being worthy. If God made this his condition, no one would receive them. This is what theologians traditionally call common grace. And it underscores that God is indiscriminate in his benevolence. Thus, when God gives the rain and sun that we need for life, this demonstrates his character and love for us. But let us not forget that God's common grace has a goal. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Make no mistake about it. The common grace of God that brings blessings to unregenerate men, which allows them to live in peace, to amass fortunes, to live in health, is the product of the goodness, kindness, tolerance, or patience of God. Why is God so good to the lost? Well, according to Paul, the purpose of God's grace is to lead men to repentance. You see, Paul had to remind his readers that the sin of unbelief has also borne the fruit of ignorance of the grace of God. And to think lightly or despise the riches of God's grace is probably the blackest of all sins. You see, when man rebelled and disobeyed God, it was an attempt to cast off the rule and authority of God over the human heart. In other words, man wanted to be God himself. Man wanted to believe that all things come from him. Therefore, if a man is going to be saved, there must be a complete reversal of position. You must get off the throne and acknowledge that God alone is God and that you are a creature subject in everything to Him. Are you in good health? Why does God permit this? The answer is that He wants you to turn to Him and acknowledge His goodness and accept the riches that He has for you. To be sure, you have many other blessings due to the common grace of God. The purpose of such riches is to cause you to turn about face and come to Him for further blessing in a genuine saving relationship in Christ Jesus. 
Now, in relation to our text, if we believe and acknowledge God's grace upon the righteous and unrighteous, we should shower enemies and friends with acts of loving kindness. Like God, we should give without regard for a return. One commentator, Alfred Plummer, wrote, and I quote, To return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. To return good for evil is divine. To love as God loves is moral perfection. End of quote. It runs against human nature to clean up the mess left behind by others, like those of your spouse, your teenage children, or like disposing the mess of a neighbor's pet dog. But the standard that the Lord Jesus teaches his children is God's nature, not ours. And our Lord wants us to aspire to God's nature and character. The second motivation that the Lord gives for loving our enemies is our call to be different as lovers of God and disciples of the Lord Jesus. The Lord said in verses 46 to 47, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? If we only love those who love us, what have we done that is special? It is amazing that we think we are doing so well because we love people who love us. We think that we are nailing God's commands because we love our friends and love people who are nice to us. The Lord says that this does not suffice. Almost everyone does this. What credit is that to you that you love people who love you? You love your spouse. You love your children. You love your parents. You love your friends. And you love people in church. Big deal. Loving people who love you is the easy part. Loving people who are your enemies is the hard part. So the Lord defines divine love negatively by comparing it to the lesser standard of ordinary decency. And sadly, we are inclined to congratulate ourselves for small, commonplace acts of kindness or decency. But the Lord teaches that there is nothing especially commendable in returning a favor. It does not count as a sign of love or virtue. If we love those who love us, we deserve no reward. Tax collectors do the same. If we greet our friends, we deserve no commendation. Even pagans do the same. And when the Lord says that even tax collectors and pagans do the same thing, he refers to some of the most despised people of his day. To be sure, the Pharisees saw themselves as more superior than tax gatherers and Gentiles. Tax gatherers were Jews who collaborated with Rome. The tax they collected funded the Roman occupation of Israel. Furthermore, pagans neither believed in God nor obeyed his laws. Thus, when the Lord told them that their brand of love was no better than the despised tax gatherer and Gentiles, they must have been enraged. Therefore, the Lord Jesus teaches that if even pagans return kindness for kindness, disciples of the Lord Jesus must certainly do more. So from our Lord's perspective, ordinary decency merely counterfeits God-like love. It is not the love He desires to see in His disciples. As we know, people are prone to think well of themselves for every token of decency. But to return a favor is nothing more than politeness and may be mere self-interest, since we know that one act of kindness begets another. 
there is no special merit in doing a favor for those who favor us. And God does not need to reward that kind of decency. Now, almost every church thinks it is friendly. But the truth is many folks in church are cold and unwelcoming to visitors. Why? Because the members are only friendly with their friends. They greet those whom they know and spend time conversing with them without regard to the visitors in their midst. This is not noteworthy. Genuine love keeps an eye open for the quiet, the awkward, and the friendless and seeks them out. At work, we know that it pays to return calls. If we share valuable information with someone, we know that he or she may subsequently share helpful information with us one day. Because of self-interest, workers serve customers with courtesy. Their job demands this. But returning phone calls, sharing information with colleagues, and serving customers with courtesy are not meritorious. These are merely examples of good work policy or practice that may prove beneficial to us. But the Lord teaches that true believers are to have a much higher standard of love and righteousness than the rest of the world. The Lord loved us when we were His enemies, and He tells us to love our enemies. So let us not be satisfied with common decency or good work ethic. Even pagans practice this. Instead, let us aspire to love strangers, even enemies, for it is the Christ-like thing to do. It should be obvious to all that we are extraordinary, for our Heavenly Father is extraordinary. In his book, The Magnificent Defeat, Frederick Buckner put it beautifully, and I quote, The love for equals is a human thing. A friend, brother for brother, it is to love what is loving and lovely, the world smiles. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail, to rejoice without envy with those who rejoice, the love of the poor for the rich, the world is always bewildered by its saints. And then there is the love for the enemy. Love for the one who does not love you, but mocks, threatens, and inflicts pain. The tortured love for the torturer. This is God's love. It conquers the world. End of quote. At this point of the Lord's sermon, his listeners must have realized that his moral standards are unattainable. Well, in the next verse, he confirms their realization. In verse 48, he says, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you read Matthew 5 merely as a set of moral demands, it is unattainable. But the Sermon on the Mount also paints a portrait of kingdom life, of life in the family of God. And that is the life that genuine believers experience in some measure. So our Lord says we must aspire to be like our Father. In the physical family, it is natural for a child to be like his father. Well, it is also logical in the spiritual family for God our Father is remaking us in His image. He has loved us with an everlasting love and the love He shows us is the love that He commands. 
Of course, the Lord Jesus is not assuming that we can reach moral perfection in this life. Rather, Jesus is reflecting on the way in which the love of the Father is demonstrated in its perfection in the way he loves his enemies. God's love for his enemies, and that means you and me, has its highest expression when he sent his only begotten son to die as our substitute on Calvary. And the man who loves his enemies in this way shows that his love is not controlled by its object, but by, its, by his own will and his commitment to the Heavenly Father's ways. The mark of perfection in the Christian is just this. His love is not determined by the loveliness or attractiveness he finds in its object. His love is not conditioned on being loved by someone first. His love is not directed only towards those whose love he can rely on in return. No, his love is controlled by the knowledge that when he was God's enemy and a sinner, the Father first loved him. So this is what the Lord meant when he called us to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. It is our duty to love our enemies and pray for them. But it is also our goal to be like the Father. It would be wrong to claim that we can achieve such a goal on our own, but God commends it to us and empowers us for it. In her book, The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom relates how she and her sister Betsy were interned in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. A number of years after the war, at a Christian rally in Munich where Corrie had given her witness of faith, she came face to face with former SS officer who had watched over the women in the camp. He came up to her and said, I am grateful for your message, Fräulein, to think that, as you said, Christ has washed away my sins. Corey said she stood paralyzed, staring at his outstretched hand. Finally, she prayed, Lord Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As Corey whispered the words, she felt her hand reach out to grasp his. She said, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that overwhelmed even me. The truth is, Corey's loving act in this episode is possible only for a Christian. Only the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ can enable a person to have this unconquerable benevolence and this invisible goodwill in his personal relationships with other people. It is only when Christ lives in our hearts that bitterness will die and this love spring to life. God loved us when we were strangers and alienated from him. He loved us when we were his enemies. Our animosity could not thwart his love. He loved us, gave us new life, and drew us to himself as his adopted children. And he has poured his transforming grace into our hearts so that we can love our friends, our neighbors, and even our enemies. But as we close, I would like you to hear again the Lord's question in verse 47. What more are you doing than others? The Lord assumes that members of the kingdom and family of God will behave not just as ordinary men. In fact, all that the Lord has taught in the Beatitudes confirm that Christians 
are not ordinary men and women. Different principles control our thinking and our living. But how tragic that many churches today have often sought to compromise and not to be different from the world under the guise of attracting the world for evangelism. This compromise is rooted in an unwillingness to let the Lord Jesus teach us the principles of his kingdom. But let us not forget that there is a high price to be paid for true Christian living. It costs everything. In the final analysis, that is what the Lord meant when he calls us to be perfect like his Father. The Sermon on the Mount simply spells it out. The Father has given everything for us, and He calls us to give everything to Him, no matter what it costs. There is actually only one basis on which a Christian can love his neighbor as himself. And the Lord spelled it out in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we were your enemies once before, and yet you loved us still. This was displayed gloriously when Christ Jesus died on the cross in our stead. Knowing this in our hearts because of a because of faith we pray that you might teach us more and more to love as you love we confess that this is a challenge for us but we desire to obey your commands we desire to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect and so we trust that through your blessed holy spirit we will be sanctified so that we can truly love even our enemies. We trust that this will be accomplished in Christ's name. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Don't grow weary in doing well don't surrender in the fight. Keep on storming the gates of hell. Keep on doing what you know is right. Don't grow weary in doing well. Don't surrender in the fight. Keep on storming. So keep on doing what you know is right. Oh, there will be seasons of testing, and there may be weeping for an eye, but soon we'll be reaping a blessing if we keep pressing on toward the cross. Spirit, keep on walking in the light. Don't be fearful or discouraged. Keep on doing what you know is right. Keep on doing what you know is right. Keep on doing what you know is right.